Today's guest believes that leaning into your strengths will help increase the odds of your success as a small business owner. Her new firm counsels small business owners on a variety of issues, ranging from streamlining processes to recruiting for key positions in organizations. Her clients include Fortune Top 100 Global Businesses. Please welcome Megan Toso to the show. Welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your podcast today. I know. You know what? You're my first guest that has started a business from literally nothing, like one client, built it into this massive business, sold it, and then started a new business. And who doesn't need encouragement as entrepreneurs to be like, yes, you can start from nothing, grow it, sell it, and start a new business. Like, This transition has been amazing for you, and I'm excited to jump in and chat about it. So let's start from the beginning. So tell me like where you started. You had this idea for a business. You were like, I'm definitely interested in helping people. Let's start from the very beginning. So Jill, I used to work in corporate America, and then uh, about 12 years ago, 12 and a half now, um, I had the opportunity to get into insurance. That is not something I ever thought that I would do. I don't have any sales experience, and when my current insurance agent at the time called me and thought it would be a good fit, to be honest, I just kind of chuckled. And she called me probably every other week for two or three months until I finally was like, okay, I'll go to lunch with you. And honestly, even though it's probably one of the hardest things that I did, it was one of the best things that I've done so far. It allowed me to start something new. So I had my own business. I was an independent insurance agency. Um, It allowed me to grow as a person. I didn't have any sales experience. So that was totally outside my comfort zone. But really what it did is it gave me the flexibility. And I'm going to just note this. Doesn't mean I worked any less, but because I owned the business, I had way more flexibility. And as my family grew, it was probably the best thing that I could have done. I mean, I worked more than I ever did when I was in corporate America, but I had the flexibility to be there um, as my family grew and I had more children. So I say from that standpoint, like, I'm really grateful that I did it, like very grateful that I did it, but it was definitely a scary experience to start off with. I know. I always tease people about that too. I'm like, I never like grew up and was like, I want to be an insurance agent when I grew up, you know, but it's really an awesome industry where you can really help people. And like you mentioned, like it is a ton of work. And for anybody listening, who's an entrepreneur, you know, that so many times you work more than you do in a typical nine to five job for someone else. But the flexibility is huge. And I feel like that's why so many people are looking for this entrepreneurial opportunity because they're like, listen, I need some flexibility, whether it's for family or for aging parents or whatever the case might be, that flexibility can be huge. So you jumped in. It it was great that you had her as a mentor to you to kind of walk you through the process. And so when you kind of jumped on board with her and then built your business from there. How long were you in business for? Um, I was in business a little over 11 years and it was great to have her and um, her suggestions and her help. But realistically, she didn't have a lot of sales experience. She was very personable and had a lot of team building so she could bring people into the fold. But she personally didn't have a lot of sales experience. So honestly, the suggestion that I got was come up with 200 names and I sent everyone a letter and then I called them. And I can tell you the anxiety, the stress, even today, any type of cold calling, it was so far out of my comfort zone. But that's where I started. I started with a political science degree, no business experience, a list of 200 names and started a business in the middle of a recession. (laughs) I love it though. I love it. That's like the best time to do it because anybody can survive when times are good. It's when times are down. If you can make it work, like then you know that you're going to be successful. So what, what did you grow it to? Like when you were ready to sell it, how had you, you know, you started essentially with probably just a couple people. What did you grow your business to before you sold it? 
Um, I grew it. I started with a list of 200 names. And by the time I sold it, I had over a thousand clients and thousands and thousands of policies. So I feel very fortunate um, that the growth over the 11 years um, was so substantial, but it was also because of the groundwork. There was a lot of work at the front end. There was a lot of working in the evenings, working um, on the weekends, putting in a lot of time. Um, I would attend networking groups. I would attend um, community events. I'd have the opportunity to speak places. There was a lot of things that I had never done before and I would do it. Like I would, if I would, had the opportunity um, to like go to UW Tacoma and speak in their um, business department, I would do it. If I had the opportunity to go to Rotary or the opportunity to go to even like um, a preschool or a school, like everyone needs insurance. Most people don't understand it and they don't, you know, it, it, they want to save money, but it's not necessarily a product where saving money is what's best for you, but it's also not a product where you want to upsell people where they can't afford it, right? You want people to be properly covered and have their assets covered. And that's what I really enjoyed about insurance was like, people are working hard, people are building for the future, and you could help them protect that in the event of an a um, accident or a loss, or, you know, in the case of life insurance, there were just so many products I could use to help my clients. That was probably like, I'm not going to say my favorite part. I think getting to know clients and over the years, having clients for years and years as their families changed, as they grew, you know, they had kids graduating or kids driving or they were retiring. That was my favorite part. But knowing that what I was doing was helping people protect what they were working so hard for gave me fulfillment in the job. I never saw myself as a salesperson. My motto and my team's motto was always, we always wanted to do the right thing. And even if the right thing didn't result in a sale, the right thing always results um, the best way, the best outcome in the future, if that makes sense. So that was like really what I enjoyed about owning the agency was the client relationships, but also giving people something that they could actually use. If you get into a car wreck and you don't have enough insurance, you know, that can bankrupt someone, you know, and those small things that you can change on a policy or you can help someone understand, that was what I really enjoyed. So, you know, someone that is driving preschoolers around in a minivan needs just as much protection as someone who owns a huge business and has 50 trucks out on the road. Like there's not um, someone that deserves less in the insurance coverage situation, as you know, you know, and that's what, what I really enjoyed was just like knowing that I, knowing that I was doing something that was actually helping people, even though insurance, you see commercials and all the crazy stuff. And I know people don't think of it that way, but it truly does help a family when they're in a wreck or if they have a fire or they have an unexpected death in their family, you know, insurance can really be a tool to help protect people. Well, I think the best thing about insurance is that, especially being an insurance agent, is that you're helping to walk people through their life. Like you mentioned, like you are oftentimes together with clients for years and you see them progress through those life cycles. And sometimes those life cycles together as you grow as people in this relationships deepens. And I think that's the most important thing for small business owners is to find an insurance agent that you trust, that you get along with, someone mm -hmm. that you can have that long-term relationship with because those people are going to know the changes in your life and to be able to make sure that you have the coverages you need as you go through that process. And I'd really love to jump in more to, I know you mentioned about like having this groundwork and ultimately a lot of folks that listen to this podcast may eventually one day sell their business. So what are some things that you did to prep yourself to get ready to sell your business? I will tell you this, and I had heard it before and I never, I never took it to heart because I hadn't necessarily planned to sell my business in the time frame that I did. But, you know, people talk about starting a few years out and I was like, well, like I had heard it at some seminars and I just really didn't think anything of it. To be honest, I only took about 12 months, which is a pretty rushed time frame. So if you are planning to sell your business, I would definitely um, agree with everyone to give yourself probably about two years because there's a lot of things you need to figure out. Like one, are you selling your real estate? Are you signing over the lease of your office? Are your employees going to the new owners? Are they going on to something else? Are you selling your company name? Are you selling your website? Are you selling your logo? Because there's so many things that a business owner owns 
yet they don't understand the value of like your website, your company name, which I will give you this little bit of advice in the future. If you ever start a business, do not use your last name. Do not use your first name. It is definitely hard when you release that business and it's attached to you and um, it is your name in there. Um, because whoever else owns it can operate it however they want and it's still attached to you. So that's just my one like tidbit of advice in the middle of this story is do not use your first name or your last name. <laughs> that's a really good um, point because I don't think people think about that, yes. you know, because you're like, oh, mm. I'm going to have this business forever. But when an opportunity arises mm. and someone's interested in your business, you've got a lot of stuff to think about. Yeah, definitely. And I was under the I just lost my headphone. <laughs> um, I was under the impression to keep my business forever. And um, in insurance, as you know, you can transfer it over to a family member. So I just thought that it would go to my, one of my kids one day would want to take it over. So when I did the naming and things like that, it seemed fine. But when you actually go to sell it, if you're not going to keep it in your family, it definitely um, can be not a hindrance, but it's just an obstacle that you have to be willing to let go. So I would definitely say that if you're planning on selling your business or even thinking about it, one one, start by going through your finances. If someone was to buy the business, what finances are they going to take over from you? Like I said, are they taking over your rent? Are they taking over your payroll? Like what items are they taking over? Because you will have to give them, depending on the sale of the business, but provide financials, provide tax returns, and you know, an expense that I might have for my business, the new owner is not going to have. So you want to make sure that you're working with your CPA or your bookkeeper to have you know, a running idea of what the finances would look like for the new owner. So you have like the actual books, like I provided like the actual finances of my business. And then we removed all the things they weren't going to take. So they did not take over my rent. They did not take over my payroll. Well, those are two huge expenses for my business. So when you take those out, the finances, I mean, the financial picture changes dr dramatically. Like, so what they're buying and what they're getting was a way more profitable, if that makes sense. So one, you want to start with your finances. Two, a lot of people sign a three-year or five-year lease. So you want to like think about that, like, oh, I'm going to sell my business in two years. So you don't want to re-sign a five-year lease. You want to negotiate a different term of the lease. Um, you want to think about how you want to get paid. Do you want to get paid in one lump sum? Are you going to take payments over three years or five years? Are you going to keep an equity component? Like there's so many different things that you can think about in that situation too. And the other is, what are you going to actually sell them? At the end of the day, I just sold my book of business. I did not sell my office locations, my um, emails, my websites, my logos, all that kind of stuff. I retained, I just sold them the book of business. So there's a lot of things to think about. And then honestly, you have to time your staff. Like you need your staff to stay on, but also, you know, my staff were people that I cared about that had been working for me for years and I didn't want to leave them high and dry. So you want to be upfront and honest about what's going on, but also some deals don't come to fruition and they might take months and months and months. And then the deal might not close at the end. And then do you want to be without the staff? So you want to have something in place to incentivize retaining your staff um, if they're not going to stand with the new owners or, you know, prepping them to go over to the new owners. Well, and that really brings up the point that you made about give yourself a, a nice long runway if this is something that you're thinking about doing, because it sounds like it's very labor intensive, even to just get your financials together. I mean, definitely that's something that you should be like updating all the time, make sure you're not paying for a bunch of random things that you're not using, but really starting to button that up. So that way, if you are starting to think about selling, it's not a mess. You know, you're not, you know, you don't have extensions for your taxes and things like that. Like everything is ready to go. Now, what's the process? You know, what's so cool about this conversation is it sounds like you can really negotiate however you want to sell your business. So like you mentioned, like, hey, I'll give you my phone number, but I'm not going to give you my email address or, you know, something like that. There's all these different aspects that you can build into this negotiation. Is that, did you realize that in the beginning or was that something that your attorney had mentioned to you and was like, hey, we can really structure this deal however we want it to be? 
It wasn't something I personally realized at the beginning because I thought like, oh, I would sell this all together. But then when we kind of started going through the process, um, I had to use attorneys in two different states because of who I ended up selling my business to. And mine was more my work email, um, which is not a mistake. I'm not going to say that. I'm a busy mom. I've got lots going on. My work email, since I was the business owner for 11 years, I accepted personal emails there too, instead of keeping it completely separate. Um, so for me, it was more of like, not that I didn't want to sell the email. It was just like, gosh, all my kids' school emails me here. You know, this is like my point of contact. And so for me, I was like, oh, I don't want to give up that email more from like, how am I going to transition everything over to a personal email, which might sound lame to some people, but when you're super busy and you got lots of going on, like transferring an email, it can be a big deal. So I only sold some of my emails. I retained my email. Um, I forwarded my website. I did not actually sell the domain or anything like that. I still own that because it does have my name in it, but we negotiated the website. If you go to my old website, it was forwarded to their new website. I did um, sell the phone number, but no, that's the thing that people don't realize there's value in everything that you have. Right. And it was a very eye opening experience because you might not think about your logo, but like for me, I sponsored tons of activities in the Tacoma Pierce County area where I was in business. Okay. So people know my logo from the back of, you know, high school basketball shirts or from at the local school, I sponsored something or here or there. So people, there is value to that logo that people recognize. You, does that make sense? Like there is value to things that you've established in the community because at the end of the day, even though you're selling an asset, you're selling all of your goodwill and you're leveraging all of your relationships that you've built because people will be like, oh gosh, you know, so-and-so, you know, I recommend her because of X, Y, and Z. And then they'll go to my website. It's forwarded to the new owner's website. A lot of people will continue to do business based on that referral, even though I've never had contact with them or my old team did. So those are things you can't really quantify, right? So the things that you can quantify, the phone number, the emails, the website, the office location, um, the clientele, if you have assets like vehicles or products or things like that, yes, you want to like break those all out separately. I mean, here's the thing. At the end of the day, everything is for sale. It's really what price are you willing? Like possibly I might've been willing to sell my email for the right price, but yeah. the headache of getting everything sorted out, it just, the price wasn't worth it at the time, if that makes sense. So, well, And it really comes down to the headache factor too. I mean, I think for a, a lot of us, we're using that business email address for a lot of personal things just because it forwards to our phone. It's just easy. And, you know, in the beginning, you're not thinking about selling your business 11 years later. You know, none of us are kind of looking that far down down the path to say, oh, you know what? I should probably split this up. I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. <laughs> but I think it's good that you mentioned yeah, that because you're right. Everything does have value. And it is, you know, to me, my phone number might not be worth a lot of money, but to another person, it might be worth a ton of money. And so it's really good to have somebody there to walk you through that process and kind of guide you for lack of a better word, because it is a whole new thing for most people. I mean, I don't know of very many business owners that have sold multiple times. So having a team to help you with that makes sense. And what's cool about that is your transition into your new business is in that <laughs> consulting role. So you've kind of switched from, you know, this consulting on the insurance side, but you've just transitioned naturally into this new business. So let's talk about that because you've got a lot of exciting stuff going on. Yeah, I'm really excited. So when I sold my business, um, it was sooner than I anticipated and it was in a different way than I thought. So it has given me some time to like, I don't want to say like have a second act, but like, I'm still in the work world. I'm not ready to retire yet. And I was like, what do I want to do with my time? And the part about my business that I love, I want to help other people with, like, I want to help other people have great client relationships. I want to help other people grow their businesses. I want to help people streamline their processes, um, update their marketing, just make their business run smoother. And so like, that is the new space that I, um, am in right now and getting in. And I just like, it's the part that I love. Like I'm excited to help you grow your business. And also there's a component of just from an efficiency standpoint and business processes, but also the financial component, because so many people 
are so busy with the day-to-day and I was there and I understand it, um, that they're not tracking their financials. They're not hiring a bookkeeper. They're not tracking where they're spending, um, what they're bringing in. And like at the bottom of the day, like that's what you want to know because like you want to figure out how you can make your business more profitable, how you can be more efficient with your time. And so like, that is the energy that I am focusing on now. And, um, I've just, uh, like all the clients I'm working with are all referral based right now. And that's been great. I will have, you know, all my Instagram and website and email and all those good things up. But right now I've just been so busy with just referrals. It's been awesome. So I'm just, um, I've got to get everything organized, but I'm really excited. But right now I've just been working with referrals. No, I love that. I think that's the best way to do business because then it's all these people that you may have worked with in your former business that are like, Hey, teach me how you did this. How were you so successful? And the best part about you is you've got that street knowledge for lack of a better word, that street cred of you're like, listen, I've been there. I've been in the trench when it's raining and there's mud everywhere. And you're like, but I got to do this. You know, it's like, you get it. You have been there with us. It's, you know, you're different than your average consultant in the fact that you have had a business. You've been in the trenches. You know that sometimes hard decisions have to be made on where our hard-earned dollars go. And I think that brings a unique perspective to your clients that maybe some other consultants don't have because maybe they have been in corporate America the whole time, or maybe they haven't been an entrepreneur with small children and a family. You know, there's all these different dynamics that you bring that are completely different from a typical consultant. And so I think that that is the best thing that you bring to this new company. And if people are like, hey, I listen to Megan. I love her energy. I think she could really help me with my business. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Well, right now, the best way would be either you can directly email me at megan.toso at gmail.com or just at Megan Toso on, on my Instagram. So those are the easiest way to get a hold of me right now. And yeah, I mean, I just feel super fortunate. I made mistakes along the way. I had a pretty steep learning curve and I just want to help people not do that. I want them to be like, hey, I know other people that have made these mistakes and not necessarily mistakes, but like just obstacles that um, prevented me from reaching my goals sooner than I could have if I had some assistance. And that's where I want to help people because there's no reason for people to have to overcome obstacles that, you know, we already know where the solution is and we can, you know, go around the obstacle instead of over and we can spend less energy with the obstacle and we can find, um, people's success sooner, you know, regardless of that success is freedom of time, money, more clients, whatever you define that as, but really like where you want to see your life and your goals for your business. Like I can definitely help people get there. Well, and that's the best part about having a coach, like any type of business or any type of sport, anything like that. They always say that you have to invest in a mentor in a coach. And that's what you are to people. And you can help them prevent costly mistakes that maybe they don't even know about that. They're not even aware that that could potentially be a pitfall. And you're like, wait a second, watch out for this because this could come and and bite you. So I'll be sure to link your email as well as your Instagram in the show notes. So if people are running or driving, they'll have quick access to it. But one question that I always ask all my clients, not clients, podcast guests (laughs) is what is one piece of advice that you would give to a small business owner? I know it's tough. Just one piece of advice. So here's what's interesting about that is that, you know, people use that saying you have to spend money to make money. And I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think as a small business owner, I believe that you need to identify what your strengths are, like what are truly your strengths and you need to lean into those strengths and go after those. And then if you have an area where it's not your strength or you could improve instead of investing in improving that area, I say you invest your money in hiring someone that that is their strength and your business will explode. It will explode. Instead of, in this example, I wasn't the best at managing staff. Like that was not my strength. My strength is relationships. It's bringing in clientele. It's connecting with people. It's growing the business. So instead of staying in the office and managing the staff, which wasn't my strength, it's not the thing that I'm best at hiring someone to do that allowed me to spend all my energy and time 
on what I was really good at and what I love to do. And it was at that switch in my business that it exploded. And I had wished that I had done it earlier, but it cost money to hire someone, you know? And so a lot of small businesses are like, I just don't have the money, but that's why I say, find out your true strengths, enjoyments, what you love to do, what gets you up in the morning and spend your day doing that. And if you need someone to run another aspect of your business, find the money, make the money, borrow the money to hire that person and your business will explode. And then the money won't even be an uh, an obstacle anymore. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think there's so many hats that we wear as small business owners. You're like, I got it. I got it. But really, (laughs) if you can move that over to someone that it's their strength, like you said, Mm -hmm. that frees up not only the mental energy, but Mm -hmm. your ability to do the thing that you're good at. And the person that you hire, they can do what they're good at. And it's like, it just comes together in this perfect like storm of like awesomeness. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think that people forget about that. I think we're always like, oh, I'll go to the next seminar. I'll go take the next class to improve myself when really we should be looking for someone else to help us. And it's not always the option that we think of right away. Definitely. And I think that for me, what really was a wake up call is when I was dreading something like, like as a business owner, you have to have lots of hard conversation. There is going to be some time that you're uncomfortable. I'm not saying that, but when it was the part of my day that I was like, Oh, this is not what I'm looking forward to. That's not where I wanted to spend my mental energy. That's not where I wanted to spend my time. Like I didn't want to dread part of my job. Like that's the awesome thing about being a business owner. There are some things that you have to do that you may not want to do, but you can focus on the things that you love to do. You're not working for someone else. You're working for yourself. No one is telling you, you have to do this and you don't want to do it. You can say, Hey, I can find someone else to help with that. Whether that's an in-house person, a mentor, a coach, a virtual assistant, you know, maybe it's a different type of structure for your employees, then you can focus on what you love because I know business owners that don't love the sales portion and they hire some awesome sales team and they focus on running the operations day to day because that's what they love. Everyone has different strengths, but at the end of the day, being a small business owner is very tiresome. It takes so much more mental energy, physical energy than any job I've ever had in my whole life. And I have lots of kids. Um, it takes so much time and energy So, you know, we want everyone to be successful. Like most small businesses don't make it to year five. We want our friends in the small business world to be successful. So focus your energy on the positive things that you enjoy doing, where your strengths lie and run with that and have other people help you. And there's a whole community, regardless of where you're located. Um, I know in the Pacific Northwest, Jill or I can help you if you need to get connected with people. There's a whole support system of other business owners that want to see other business owners succeed. I'm one of those people. If you need any advice, you want any assistance, reach out. I'm always happy to help. Jill is happy to help. There are tons of other business owners that would happy to help other people because the small business world is small and it's connected and we want to support one another. So many good reminders. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think that I always say like us small business owners, we got to stick together because we are responsible for so many successful businesses all over the U.S. and we got to stick together. We got to learn from each other. We got to help each other out. So thank you so much for spending time with us. There was so many like golden nuggets in that conversation. Thank you again for spending your busy time with us. I know this is kind of crazy time for you, but I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jill. Thanks to all your listeners. I really appreciate it. And again, I truly mean it. If anyone needs any recommendations or assistance or I can help in any way, I'm always happy to do so. 